Welcome to Channel's Book Club. I am Olakunle Kasumo. This week, political economist, educator, and former presidential aspirant, Professor Pat Sutomi, discusses the subject of leadership, which is the central theme of his latest book titled The Art of Leading. Are leaders born or developed? Is everyone a leader? What are the attributes and styles of leadership? How is leadership so critical to national growth? These and many more are some of the questions Professor Tomi tried to answer in this new book. At his home in Ikoyi, Lagos, together we attempt to explore the book and matters related. You may want to watch out for where he shares his views on Nigeria's political leaders, dead and alive. Enjoy. Okay, the art of leading. <clears throat> um, let me read what you wrote here in page eight. The art of leading here. Um, it was also important that the CVL message, CVL of course, your, yeah, your organization, showed that all could and should lead. All could and should lead. As a person may in one context be a leader and in another be a follower. Now, I think that this is a major issue in Nigeria. You know, we, we say, oh, Nigeria's problem is leadership, Nigeria's problem is leadership, Nigeria's problem is leadership. And it seems to me that we are always talking about political leadership in Abuja. Mm -hmm. Not even political oh, leadership, oh, not even the one in the local government, <laughs> the one in Abuja. Abuja yeah. what, do you, what, what do you think about that from, from, from what you wrote here? Yeah, no question in my mind that uh, the challenge of leadership is in the family. Part of our trouble in this society is that the family is not being led. And because there's no good leadership in the family, we're producing miscreants for society and people who aren't doing the right things. The institutions that we know of are not being well led. The schools, even religious organizations, mm. are not being well led. Uh, not to talk of public life and local government, states, and you know. So there's a, a Canadian called Robin Sharma. He, he visited Nigeria, I think, two, three years ago. Who's was written a really interesting book, The Leader Who Had No Title. I've read that book. Fantastic. Fantastic book. Robin Sharma's, uh, and I think, again, I've tried to get many people to read that book. Uh, by now, I think Robin Sharma should be paying me for, <laughs> for my <laughs> <getting> <laughs> book. <laughs> and I need to send him and a, I love a the mail. Title. The Leader Who Had No the Title. Had In fact, at the CVL, we have a, a series that we're on which is called The Leader Who Had No Title Tribute Colloquium Series. Every month, we select an outstanding Nigerian who did not need a title mm. to provide leadership. And we honor that person. Mm. Uh, as a base, you have, to, you have to be over 70 years old. And so we've honored people like Mr. Kintola Williams, Dr. Michael Omolayoli, uh, Professor Anya was the last in the series. Uh, and so on and so forth. Because it's important for us to make the point that you don't need to be called minister mm. or president mm. or, governor or governor to lead. That's very important. Yeah. I give an example of a bank in Lagos. I shouldn't mention the name because they're my clients or they were my clients back in those days. That lost a huge customer, really huge customer. And they were trying to find out what's the problem. We'll call him Indian guy and he would rattle off about some excuse and the other until they went to him and said, look, my friend, what's the matter? And the guy said, look, I had a meeting in your office one day. I arrived about 10, 15 minutes past five, I had an appointment with the, one of the general managers. I got there, the security man said, yes. I said, look, I have a meeting. He said, don't you have a wristwatch? Yeah. It's past five. I said, yeah, yeah, please uh -uh. go. Whoa. This man drove himself in a Honda Accord. And in Nigeria, if you are important, you are in the back of an SUV or that kind of big car. Poor security man 
did not know that he was dealing with that, that bank's one of his most important customers, and the guy walked away with his business. Mm. And the MD of the bank could not do more damage than that foot soldier did. Mm. And that's why everybody must be trained to lead, mm. including that foot soldier. So these days when I go to banks and I see security men saying, welcome to this bank, well, say, okay, somebody has learned something that's trying to. Mm. So we all can lead. We all should lead, no matter what title we have. Hmm. Okay, Prof. I, I, I want to live on the edge for, for a few seconds here. Hmm. You wrote in page, I mean, I think from page 15, about page 15 or so there, how education was, how education is critical to raising great leaders and how education was fantastic back in those days, you know, and how it reflected in the kind of leadership that um, Nigeria produced back then. With all due respect, your generation has led Nigeria to where it is today, right now. So what went wrong? Yeah, I, I hate to put the needle in your balloon <laughs> and say to you, you're you're not the first person to ask that question. It's not an original <laughs> question. <laughs> that old question. You've had a lot of that. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was in, the, in, the, in the class at the Lagos Business School some years ago. And then I carried on about the quality of education in the 60s. And I turned to Sir Eric Ashby. Ashby was this Briton from Oxford that led the Ashby Commission on Higher Education in Nigeria, who made the point that the quality of higher education in 1960, 61 was as good as the very best in the world. And in fact, it was easier to get into Harvard back then than it was to get into UI. Um, and this young lady really got upset. Ah, I made this. It was so good. Why are we here? Come on, you guys have made such a mess of the country. <laughs> and very calmly, I said to her, you know, that generation that got that education has never led Nigeria. Hmm. And I told the story that I eventually wrote off as an op-ed piece in The Guardian a few years, a few weeks later. And the piece was titled, The Generation That Left Town. Uh, what happened in Nigeria, I keep talking about the dangerous alchemy of the convergence of soldiers and oil. Oil came, military rule came, and damaged Nigeria in the way that it mixed. Uh, when the military came, the politicians, the, these leaders that we talked about, the Mbazulika, Mechis, the Awalawas, the, they kind of retreated from the, the space, except, of course, you know, go on. In a very wise move, brought people together in an inclusive way to try and uh, 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 wage the civil war. Um, you know, the attackers, this, all of them came together. But after that, you know, um, military went solo, going down the line. Progressively, the military found ways of humiliating and bringing down academia. And some of the best of them began to leave Nigeria. My favorite example was when I came back from graduate school in 82. Uh, there were a bunch of young PhDs. We used to gather around the General Institute of International Affairs. Dr. Femi Aribi Salah, um, you know, Henry Udoe, Black Jimmy Peters, Ulisa Bakoba. Many of them were, in fact, research fellows at the NIA. We, a number of us had uh, not done a proper hand count, but we had close to 20 in number. And I said in that op ed piece, as I write, only two and a half of us still live in Nigeria. <laughs> Somebody said, how can you be two and a half? I said, well, one is Ulisa Bakoba, two is myself, the other is Femi Aribi Salah. And Femi Aribi Salah, half of him belongs to God, half of him belongs to Nigeria. <laughs> because Femi is now in the newspapers again with St. Paul and all the pastors every Sunday. <laughs> so uh, um, the rest simply left Nigeria. 